I'm going to spend 100 days in Xenoblade Chronicles 3. Not only am I going to beat the game, but I'm also going to try to unlock every hero class within that time frame. The game starts off with some annoying kid telling me to run faster. Hop, hop, run like you mean it. I will move as fast as I like. Then some child pulls out the remote from Click to pause everyone. And now we're in war. Way to mess up the timeline, kid. The same guy pulls out the Monado. I don't know. This is my first Xenoblade game. <laughs> Worry about yourself, oh. Noah. Worry about yourself. Can I help? First tutorial says, remember to auto attack. Um, how can I forget when it's doing all the work for me? Back attack? Don't you mean... Backslash! Also, everyone seems to have an accent. Looks like they're busy guarding the artillery. They're not going anywhere. Uh-oh. Waifu alert. We win the first fight because I took a cheap shot at their back. Our army celebrates with a victory yell. Lives are ours! Your life! Are we the baddies? So apparently, to continue on living, we must shed the blood of our enemy in order to steal their life force. We each have a lifespan of 10 years. Each year is called a term. You're considered lucky to make it that far, considering all the war that's going on. We even have a queen, who I'm convinced is Corella Deville. She's the one that sends them back to heaven when they complete their lifespan. This ceremony is called homecoming, and it's essentially the goal of everyone here. Noah makes his friends stay so he can play the flute, putting the dead souls to rest. Transport is already left which means we have to walk home and the group takes it all out on this little dragonfly geez a little harsh guys we make it back to colony nine i think they meant to put district nine anyways the group dips into a hot bath and uni what were you just staring at anyhow noah and uni reflect on the sad death of their friend yorin from the past lands interrupts their moment and starts an argument with uni giving noah a better view of her <sighs> this team Early the next morning, the district alarm goes off. Turns out there's an unknown enemy heading our way and we're tasked to neutralize it. To prepare, I put on this hat. I do feel tougher already. Dude, you didn't even put it on. Wow, that's the mark of a good piece of gear. Are you all delusional? Hey, Noah, I'm a ninth timer too. What? Jeez, I thought we were young. Last thing to equip is the air slash art. Air slash! Come on, Noah, put some gumption into it, like... There are plenty of monsters to fight along the way, but admittedly, I don't know how to run away from battles yet. The giraffe was kicking our butts, and no matter how far I ran, nothing happened. So there's my first death. I mean, how the heck did I beat this rock monster and lost to some random giraffe? More importantly, it's then revealed that our other friend Mwamba only has one month of life left, and he really wants to make it to homecoming. So after this op, he's going to transfer to the salvage department. At nightfall, we spot an aircraft with some kind of cloaking tech, but the weird thing is both us and the enemy faction are targeting it. The unknown airship is shot down and we make our way towards it. By the way, Agnes is the name of the enemy nation. They usually sport the white color on their machinery and armor. And our side is Kevis, with black being our uniform color. Things weren't looking good for us until Uni came along, healing some comrades, then pulls off a sick shot against Agnes' soldiers. Then we find robots controlled by no pilots. They're no match for us though, since I've been using the side break attack, which can lead to lands toppling them over, then Uni dazing them. Right when we we are close enough to rush the mysterious bearded man, three specialty Agnes soldiers cross paths with us initiating a fight. The battle was close, almost losing my teammates during the brawl. But in the end, I bested those three whiteys. Their masks break off, revealing their true identities. Amy with the hammer from Sonic, Gambit from the X-Men, and a frisbee golfer. All of a sudden, the bearded man stops our quarrel and pauses to look at Noah's blade as if it was familiar to him. Also noticing that Noah is an officer, he entrusts us with his key bit of information because the face of your real enemy is <laughs> got a whole game to play through. Can't get spoiled too soon. Oh, and unfortunately, it looks like Mwamba ain't gonna make it to the end because of whatever this thing is. All right. Ah! Agnes is pissed as well since one of their own was killed too. With our combined forces, we defeat the mysterious enemy. Wait a minute. He's actually kicking our trash. Was that whole fight a lie? Looks like the bearded guy dying was also a misdirect as he opens this egg-like object, sending off some sort of green energy through each of our astral forms. Noah and one of the Agnes girls are somehow combined, fusing with enough power to blast back our opponent. And just like any classic villain, he begins to monologue, explaining that when Kevis and Agnes come together in unity, they can interlink into Ouroboros, our current form. He calls himself Mobius and starts another battle with this epic opening choir. Let me give you a check!
Best part about this new form, it comes with a surfboard. Cowabunga! And unlike the previous cutscene, this one shows us actually winning. Just before we can finish him, he blasts a red Ouroboros symbol to the sky and states that the whole world will now be our enemy, then runs away. The old man begins to fade away, saying he was 60 years old and that we deserve more than 10 years. Going to Sword City can help change that. Noah explains to both sides that when he and the girl fused, they felt each other's thoughts and memories. The other four don't really care and vow the next time they meet, it'll be as enemies. As for gameplay, I now get to control Uni, learning the ways of a healer. Ah oh man, they had to make my boy Rowlet a bad guy in this game? Takes us almost a whole day to get back to the colony, just to be ambushed by our own people. Noah recalls when Mobius said the world was now their enemy. They have no choice but to flee. The same goes for the Agnes trio. This gives me the opportunity to play as their leader Mio with the role of defender. And I changed my mind. She's not a frisbee golfer. She's Krillin from Dragon Ball Z. Surprise, surprise, the band's back back together. Dude, what are we doing about the homecoming? This dude really loves his dances. Nah, dude, we've already decided to embark to Sword City like the old guy mentioned. And what are these two creatures hanging out with us for? Anyways, time for introductions. My name's Noah. Hi, Hi Noah. Noah. Oh, and this is my passion. I'm called Mio. Hi, Hi Mio. I can do the 100 metri in seven seconds. Uni's the name. Hi, Hi Uni. My hobby. Collecting fortune clovers, I guess. And I'm Senna. Hi, Hi Senna. Senna. My hobby is... Going Super Saiyan Blue. I'm Tyon. Hi, Hi Tyon. Tyon. I don't have hobbies. Riku. In Colony 9, Riku was head of maintenance and crafting. I'm Manana. Manana was cookie pot in Colony of Mio and others. Uh, my name's... Lance? Hi, Hi Lance. Lance. Do we have to? do this rubbish. We change clothes before heading south, and Noah continues to stare at the girls changing until Mio calls him out on it. Creep? Speaking of creeps, some lady snatches the eye patch from the old guy's remains. And why not? A quick flashback showing the Kvesi trio in danger until a powerful lady named Ethel saves them. And another one for good measure, showing a conversation between these beings that are each called a certain letter of the alphabet. Now for some great voice acting. No! Yeah! With a team of six and the ability to now control anyone in the party, we plow through encounters. I harvest a power source called Ether, use it to bring the power back to this Hulk, fabricate some items, and... Ah! More of those little thingies! This one is supposedly a shill salesman. No, really, its actual name is shill. Something that humans can do in this world is pull up menus with their right eye. A new feature they get from Ouroboros is the ability to change classes. Only one each for now, though. Tyon informs us that two paths lie ahead. The first goes near Agnes Control, and the second goes through the safe desert, but it's slower and way hotter. We go the safe route despite Tyon complaining about the heat. So hot. Well, Mio looks like she's about to die, so maybe Tyon was right. Until... Water. Ew, gross. Those little gremlins are naked now. Lance, kill those things for me. Okay, okay, they do have some use. Manana can cook, and Riku leads us into battles that we automatically lose. <laughs> nah, I kid. This is where the game teaches you about chain attacks, but I'll get into those later. In the end, we win. Riku gives us three out of five stars. Do we really need this guy? All right, he finally shows off his talent, crafting gems, which grant unique effects. During their morning walk, Mio asks Noah where he got his unique blade. He explains that Riku kept the sword called Lucky Seven crafted by seven legendary swordsmiths. Over the course of seven years, years forged with seven types of steel. Noah disguises it to look like his original blade like a sheath and can pull it out for full power when dire situations arrive. My question is, why did Riku give it to some kid? Back to our desert journey, it looks like a huge Kavesi tank is firing at us. To top it off, Ethel is leading the assault and we get to see how people see us when they have the red iris casted upon them from Mobius. You'd think I'd run away as fast as I can, but I just had to nab these items, which led to my death. Next time, I just ran. In their pursuit, they even ended up killing some of their own. We then follow a pattern of running, then fighting, running, then fighting, 
And I'm all like, why don't we just beat up Ethel? But nah, this is one of those games where you win and the cutscene shows you losing. Her eyes start to see clearly. So one of those red beings we saw earlier takes over the pursuit. They're each called consoles, followed by a specific letter and they oversee commanders from each colony like Ethel. Now let's talk about those chain attacks we learned about recently. On the right of the screen, once this gauge fills up, you can start a chain attack. This consists of first selecting one of three bonuses you can get. If you're able to build up over 100 tactical points, or TP for short, characters with the attacker role get a 1.5 multiplier if chosen first. Healers can't go above 99% on the meter, which can lead to the last attack getting as many points as possible, resulting in the follow-up bonus dealing more damage. You repeat the process for a total of 2-4 to four times depending on the order you send your characters. Problem is, I wasted it all on a random grunt. Luckily, I targeted Console K during my second chain attack. After defeating him, he transforms into Mobius and starts sucking life from the soldiers to heal himself. Noah deciphers that if we can smash the flame clock, maybe Mobius will no longer be able to regenerate. While attempting to do so, Lands and Senna miraculously transform into their own version of Ouroboros. Happens to Uni and Tyon as well, giving us two more Ouroboros to work with. Noah unsheaths Lucky Seven, slicing the flame clock in half. The real reason how this guy lost, though, was this. I just wanted to play around a little more. Yeah, that's what you get for toying with your foe. Oh, dude, there's a guy under the mask? Afterwards, we reveal the truth to Ethel and her colony to get them up to speed. We're given a tent, and Senna wants to take a bath with Uni. You're not getting that cutscene, boys. After some discussion, the party realizes that they have the same consoles, meaning they're likely scheming something from both sides. And now suspicion grows about our queens. Speaking of which, both queens are being told by their consoles to order their sides to eliminate Ouroboros. Then a flashback shows a woman telling Tyon to run, saving his life. We get another cutscene showing the consoles and the shortest one volunteers to take us on next. Ethel's colony, Colony 4, needs medical supplies, so we decide to intercept an Agnes supply drop. Instead of killing the Agnes troops, we save them from a pack of wolves. Well, at least some of them. But yo, forget about those dead bodies. Freaking Ethel joins the team. Time to hit the boss. And the moment is ruined. Noah is also enabled to switch over to Ethel's flash fencer class. At the end of the day, Ethel does not come with us when we leave. What a tease. As our travels continue, we got spied on, then ambushed by some kid. Here's what I do to little brats like you. His name is Valdi, and it turns out he had no evil intentions. Just wanted the rewards that were tied to killing us. He's also a mechanic and a commander of Colony 30. We help round up the parts for his broken bots from our battle, and notice he holds the Infinity Gauntlet. If only it could speed up these boring encounters where you just auto-attack the whole time. Anyways, instead of building more warlike bots, Valdi puts one together that's priority is to take care of him. But then his leader arrives, Consul Q. He's supposedly not here to rile things up with us, rather to retrieve Valdi in order to finish the ultimate levness. Oh yeah, that's what the machines are called in this world. Valdi chooses to destroy it, but is interrupted by the Consul, who then takes control of the mighty levness. Just as he was about to kill Valdi, the mini levness saves him, blocking the console's rampage. Now it's time for us to take matters into our own hands. And I gotta say, it really wasn't hard. Having three healers in the party ensured our safety. Did that console really just die from a simple explosion? Either way, Mio and Noah break the colony's flame clock, freeing them from its bounds. Valdi joins the fray with us and grants us the ability to climb purple vines. As we climb, the bad guys watch us from a movie theater. Oh gosh, this world has a flying fish! Sharknado! Also, the short console member is back and he's getting someone named Isser to do the dirty work for him. You know what Manana just told me? She said that in the night, the trees wake up and start to wander. <gasps> Is Manana from Middle Earth? It causes the team to pull an all-nighter, leading them to a battlefield of dead corpses. Uni finds one with her name on the dog tags. Discovering it's her gets a confusing flashback, but keeps the thought to herself. She concludes the same name must be a coincidence. Yeah, keep telling yourself that, Uni. Even though all the dead people seem to be Kabesi, Tyon notices there are no Agnian corpses nor their weapons. Maybe you spoke too soon because an Agnes Levness pops out of nowhere. Once beaten to a scrap, Tyon informs us that it's an autopilot 
piloted one and has probably sent data back to its colony. So we scram. At camp, Uni dozes off, bringing back those memories again. The real problem with her past is, why do you not have a freaking helmet on? You're in the middle of war! The Mobius she faced acted a lot like Vecna when it came to killing their victims. Uni is obviously shaking from that vision. Day 14, we head back to Colony 30 to help out with some side quests. Then we run into an old pal from our home, Colony 9, named Zeon, who's trying to kill us. You guys sure this is an old friend? We're able to calm them down and attempt to prove our trust by helping them fend off incoming Agnes forces. We do just that, but we only kill their captain since we do somewhat care for Agnians as well. We return to Colony 9, and unfortunately, a consul meets us there. He strikes an attack with a stomp of his foot. Zeon blocks it for us. As he distracts Consul B, Noah destroys the flame clock, liberating his friends. Obviously, Consul B isn't a fan of what just happened. Thus, he transforms into his Mobius form. This fight took so long that it's already nighttime again. That's another one of those letter men extinguished. Zeon convinces his colony to give us a chance and passes the commander role to his second in command. Then Zeon talks about becoming a farmer. Joins the team anyways. Alright, let's get back to the main storyline. Along the way, Tyon and Lance finally start getting along. Things have been rough between them since the beginning. We enter tunnels, operate elevators, and Manana helps with fighting? <laughs> Manana. It's also revealed that Riku probably has a crush on Manana due to him worrying so much about her. Try not to look down. Too late. I thought I was going to die here from fall damage, but the transition to a cutscene saved my skin. Riku and Manana want to help fight. I don't know, guys. This might not be the safest. Oh, well, he's got a gun, so that's pretty nice. My mind has changed. They officially joined the squad as heroes, and Senna gets a new thirst trap outfit. A few moments later in the cave, we get trapped in the fog while Ag and soldiers surround us. Lance expresses his trust in Tyon's judgment, so the team runs off and escape via a water current. Isard, the commander that little red guy ordered around earlier, ambushes us. Since he has a pass with Tyon, he knew they would escape the way they did. The guy seems to be mind controlled since Tyon knows him as the kindest man he's ever known. Either way, it's time to bring him down. And I like how for this boss, they warn you not to go in their red circle, yet it never moves. Uni dives in, saving Tyon from the incoming blast, instigating a new Ouroboros transformation. That's because all the interlinks we've seen before have been controlled by the Kavesi trio, but this time it's Tyon that's in control using a multiplication technique, then drops a fake boulder on them. Senna notices this change and believes she and Lans can do the same. Senna slides in with her new Ouroboros form as well as toppling over Isard's vehicle like a Star Wars AT&T. Isard begins firing all of his lasers, even killing his own. So Mio gets in close with her Ouroboros to give Noah the opening to take out the flame clock. That's the first Agnes one we've done. The commander turns into Mud Pie, then Consul J shows up revealing himself to be Yorin? Noah lands in Uni's friend that died years ago? He explains that he can now take people's memories and fashion them into mud puppets. All of a sudden, he's quite literally backstabbing people on his own side. Looks like we have a boss battle on our hands. Right as it begins, the game shows that we can now use Ouroboros during chain attacks. In order to trigger them, you must complete two character completion bonuses that can interlink together. Once done, a new option will appear, and you can go to town with not only a sick new animation, but some massive damage to go along with it. Came close, but still lost though. I was barely underleveled, but I think the real issue was that some of my party members were not equipped with the best classes. I had them like that because if you shift them around, they can learn new moves and skills. With the team fixed up and a third healer added, I was able to win after a couple more tries. A flashback is given to show that Yorn wasn't so sinister back when he was alive, even pushing Lance out of the way to save his life while he died from the falling debris. So who are these consoles? You don't get it. You honestly don't get it. No, I don't. Are you a mud puppet? He pieces out seemingly unharmed, and now our inner leaks have skill trees. The real commander, Isard, is found back at his colony and gives Tyon the necklace of the woman who saved his life, Nimu. Isard wants him to bury it at a place that was special to her. Then at camp, Lans and Noah argue about whose fault it really was that Yorin died. Noah wants Lans to drop it and stop blaming himself. Lans stomps off. Uni calms him down. Now to get some side quests done. I haven't really fast traveled much until now, so in order to keep track of my days properly, I try to travel around the same time of day using these options on the map. We begin another hero quest, first by saving Mio and Senna's friend. As we escorted her back to her colony, an eagle blew us off a cliff bridge, taking us back to camp. 
What a cheap shot. Anyways, we reach Colony Gamma, and shockingly, these Agnians are not seeing us as the bad guys. We meet their commander named Teach. Commander Teach? That name should be illegal. Two jobs in one name? We talk to him about helping, but he insists on meeting at a different place before doing so. Mio and Tyon are worried about it, while everyone else doesn't see the problem. After leaving, he mentions to someone that we're traitors. That someone being another console member. It takes a whole day's journey to get where Teach wants to meet, and along the way, he taught us how to walk up sandy slopes without sliding down. The team is exhausted, but we made it to the end with a view that looks like it could be Xenoblade 4. What a swell guy. Wants to execute us in private rather than back in public. I personally thought we were doing pretty well until Land says, Spock's sake. We can't take him down and he's just one guy. We were winning. Doesn't matter though, because Teach no longer believes we're traitors and asks if Console G agrees. Nah. It's Morbin time. And with that phrase, he flopped. Colony Gamma is now freed from their clock, and Teach is added to the roster. On to our next destination, we find some artifact. Then some mystery guy, who I'm pretty sure is the Reaper from Overwatch, demands we hand it over. Teach gives the guy a lesson, so he flees by diving into the river. Tyon isn't sure if we should follow, because the guy could be hostile. But Uni has a great plan. If he does, then we whack him. And if he doesn't, we listen to what he says. Great plan or what? We catch up to him, and he shares his name. Great. Call me Gray. Okay, Xenoblade Darth Vader. Cool thing is, we can call him into battle whenever needed. On our way back, we run into Agnes soldiers. Then some girl comes out of nowhere with the Violet Sword from Fire Emblem Three Houses. Behold, the understudy cast of Xenoblade Three. They are a silver rank colony, so we have to be cautious with our approach. We prepare by leveling up with some training at camp. Uni trains with guns while Senna has a sword. A little unfair. First get a jar. Patrick, that's a gun. Yes. After exploring, we find the group's colony, Iota. And what better strategy than just to run past them all? Her name is Alexandria, and we're just a tad lower level than them. So yeah, we straight up die. I guess we'll just go back and help Isser for now. We help him make a bridge barely, save his troops from spiders, then check on his autopiloted Levenesses just to find out they're still hunting us down for some reason. So Isard puts them out of commission for now. The mechanics find out later that since they restarted the Levenesses, that the protocol to not harm us was also removed. Sure, yeah, buddy. At least another commander is added to our arsenal. Okay, back to progressing the main story. Wait, I don't remember a dragon being on our to-do list. Would you just die already? We decide to trek towards the Kavesi castle since Ethel told us she'd be reporting there. Worried for her, we make our way. While she's there, she meets with the queen and sees the golden console named N, head of all the Kavesi consoles. Eh, looks a little familiar. He shows off a big cannon by destroying one of the favored mountains. All right, you cannot tell me this isn't a Darth Vader Princess Leia scene, especially when they show Ethel's colony as the next target. Meanwhile, this scene shows just how dense Noah is. Super villain pawn. Riku, what does that mean then? Yeah, you're serious? You, you can't take a wild guess what that means? Then some kiddos that just got done playing Sonic Adventure 2 pop out of nowhere to ambush us. I would like to say we kick their trash, but you know, the cutscene's probably gonna show us losing. Oh, wow, we actually won the fight. We follow them back to their colony and find out it's mostly abandoned. The people will die soon with what little they have left of their flame clock. They don't really care though. If they die, they die. That's their attitude. Funny they say that, then need help to literally save their lives from a attacking monsters. I thought you guys were fine with dying. And of course, just like every other storyline in the game, a simple favor changes their minds. Best part is, Juniper brings us a sick new archer class. And we can rail grind now. We continue onward, are then interrupted by a quick random mini boss fight. The Mananas poor wimpy feet make us stop for the day. Come on, it just started. As we rest, some strange looking turkeys steal our food. Yeah! Oh, the food's completely gone! What kind of voice acting scream was that? And who says gasp? It's an action. The group's first accusation is Manana, but it's soon resolved that Turkins were the real culprits. No matter who it was, we need food, so we go hunting. Just as we were wrapping up, Ethel's comrade, Bullieris, shows up a bit tattered. He gives us a recap of what happened back at the castle, where Ethel was commanded to kill us or watch her colony die. Not only that, she's teaming up with her lifelong rival, 
Kamuravi. But they're on opposing sides. Why? Entertainment. Eh, uh, yeah. He's a classic evil, all right. The squad decides to take a detour to the castle and destroy the Annihilator themselves. Noah's been there before thanks to the Offseer training and says they can use the Black Fog there to their advantage. The next night, Mio notices she's starting to lose some of her feeling because, well, she's only got two months of life left. She gets mad at Noah, accusing him of taking things too casually and maybe they shouldn't detract for the sake of Colony 4. And just like every guy in the world, Noah tries to fix things rather than simply listen. Senna even confirms she she just needed to vent and is kind of jealous because Mio doesn't do that with her. In the morning, they apologize to each other and Mio asks to trade flutes because hers belonged to her friend until she died saving her. Her wish is to have the flute be used a little longer. They don't even get far into their travels until they are confronted by two large Pharonises, machines piloted by Ethel and Kamuravi. And that's not all. Two consoles appear as well, O and P. How are six little shrimps like us gonna take on these two giants? I have no idea how, but so far we're holding our own. The consoles get impatient. They can't do much with Ethel since she's not tied to a flame clock, but they can cast a red iris onto Kamuravi's left eye to mind control him. However, he hates being controlled so much he gouges his own eye out. That way he can do what he wants. Now instead of us, they fight each other because they're rivals to the end and this is what they love to do most. Okay, I'm happy for you both, but we could really use your help here, instead of you both killing each other. What we leave you is more important. All our aspirations. Okay, again, what am I supposed to do with your aspirations? How do I use that? Ah, uh, too late. They're both dead. The consoles decide to kill us themselves. They interlink similar to us and love playing around with their food. Because they could have just done that sooner. They monologue forever about their greatness and Mio is sick of it kicking them in the face. But I just realized, Mobius O and P? The OP Mobius? This is unbeatable. There's no way we can- Oh, never mind beat them on the first try. They're about to get revenge by exploding, but Mio and Noah simply chop off a piece of the cliff, causing Mobius to fall and explode beneath them. Well, during the next day, just before we arrive at the castle, the Darth Maul of Xenoblade shows up, helps us clear out the invading Levnuses from Colony 11, then reveals. I'm the commander of Colony 11, whose soldiers just attacked us. Wow, cool. Wait, what? So we're clearly dealing with a sus commander. For some reason, we go along with her and after a couple fights against her own colony, we find out Consul R has been in control of Colony 11 against their own commander, Ashura. They blab a bit back and forth, insulting each other, then R transforms into Mobius. We had the chance to kill her, but Ashura decides not to, claiming it'd be a waste. So she lets her go and hopes she comes back to fight some more. The only other person I know that thinks like this is Goku, just looking for a stronger opponent no matter the danger. Whatevs. Let's smash the flame clock. She may be crazy, but I check off her hero quest anyways, because who doesn't want a warrior like that on their side? The next couple days, we arrive near the entrance of the castle. Noah warns the group that they're probably expecting us because they knew our location back in the forest when they sicked Ethel on us. It was pointless to bring up though, because we go in anyways. Little did they know they were being watched. We get a little closer, then plan our route of infiltration. Okay, is it just me, or is this looking like another rendition of Star Wars Episode 4 all over again? We we go find a container to hide in, then are unknowingly brought into the castle. While in the castle, there were lots of grunts to face and many levels to scale. However, unfortunately, I pretty much wasted an entire day just to backtrack it all because I fell. Eventually, we made our way to the Annihilator. Once there, a shot is fired at us, barely missing. Ended up being one of the Mobiuses. How'd you figure it out? You lot aren't too bright, are you? Lance, we talked about this. They were expecting us. Uni has yet another flashback showing us this guy was there when she died. They go into their human form, revealing to be Yorin and some other dude. They interlink like P and O did, and the battle commences. There were some intense moments in this battle where multiple teammates were knocked out, and sometimes a healer was gone so. In this game, if all your medics die, your whole team loses without the power of revives. Once that phase was beaten, Mobius turns things up a notch, slicing limbs off our Ouroboros form. Then the other Mobius reveals he and Uni have met before. She gets flustered, so Tyon takes over in the moment. They switch back to Uni, who gets put into a troll cold pretty much right away. However, that was just an illusion formed from Tyon's Mondo cards. Uni comes back for real this time, putting her heel to their face, but has to kick away to break off the Annihilator, allowing the Mobius duo to get away right before the weapon blows up. We know they made it out alive because Tyon stuck one of his Mondo into their body, so he can now sense them. Now back to the castle. We stumble 
stumble into the throne room and find the place where they keep the unborn inside these yellow pods. What doesn't make sense though is one of them is Ethel in a first term body. The Kevis Queen appears alongside N. Only the Queen fights us and we kick her royal majesty's butt. Well, kind of. Because yet again, after winning a major battle, the cutscene shows our opponent unharmed behind some magic wall thing the whole time. Oh wait, she cracked? So I guess we did win versus a robot? Her majesty is a machine. However, the presence of N makes Noah's head hurt. Mio notices that he had a familiar looking sword as well. He then receives a transmission stating that the lost numbers are attacking, to which then a couple aircrafts break into the castle. N blocks their gunfire like a Sith Lord. The gang's nerves are calmed as they recognize the look of the Levenesses are the same ones on the night that brought them together. They also snag some of the yellow containers, Ethel being one of them. Our heroes make it out and N reveals his face to be... Oh shoot, Mio too? We then cut to a flashback of Senna watching Mio at training, owning some of the older students, but not much else happens. Lance discusses these memories with her and asks why she feels alone a lot. Senna gets defensive, saying Lance is being nosy. Unsure how successful their trip to the castle was, they're like, oh crap, remember we're trying to get to Sword City? But the biggest realization for me was learning you can level up the whole party at once when at camp. Would have been nice to know earlier. <laughs> Anyways, once we get near Sword City, the lost numbers show up again, advising us they are against Mobius as well. Their leader introduces themselves as Monica, daughter of the old guy that gifted us Ouroboros. Before entering the city, we need to equip ourselves with eye patches that block the signal given from our irises. Arg. As we're being escorted, Uni asks what it means to be a daughter, which reminds Monica that our party has no concept of what parenthood is. She explains they need the eye patches as well, since their eyes give off an Ouroboros radio signal too. Once inside the city, Monica informs them they have jamming technology so the patches are safe to remove. The city folk here whisper about us expressing doubt and the group sees old and young people which aren't typical of their kind. Monica then informs us that the girl with pigtails, Shania, was the one spying on us this whole time. It was how they knew we needed to be rescued back at the castle. Monica also explains to us about the yellow cradles they stole from the castle. They are growth modules which power Mobius, recycling the lives of Kevis and Agnes, confirming Uni was having flashbacks of a past life. Monica brings them to a maternity ward where birth is given. It's okay to touch her. Hold up. No mom ever says that. If you ever ask a mom to hold their baby, they load you with hand sanitizer. Who wants to know how babies are made? Oh no. Oh no. Don't give the fandom what they want. What else is going on here? Oh geez, Noah and Mio really want to make out. Monica's last lesson is showing them the first Ouroboros. One looks like Mio and another one's got Noah's chin. But the key piece of information was that there can only be six Ouroboros at a time. After a good night's rest, we're briefed on how to find the real queens. You're looking for Gondor. Like... From Lord of the Rings? No, no, it's just some lame human stuck in a prison cell who will be executed in a month. Sounds like enough time for me to finish that hero quest I kept losing to earlier. I'm seven levels higher than you this time, sucker. You're gonna feel my row. Oh, I lost. How? I checked out some training drills for the heck of it, but didn't learn anything that made a substantial difference. Again, I'll get back to that one later and try to recruit Monica instead. She asked us to gather some of their fallen soldiers' belongings and bring them to their memorials. Noah and Mio play their flutes as loved ones of the fallen mourn their deaths. The people are touched by their kind tribute, inspiring Monica to join us. Later, we meet a napon that goes by the name of Mr. Salmon. He's got a ship that can get us to Prison Island, but he needs fuel to power the boat. 300 ether to be exact. It's not as bad as it sounds. Just need to get the storage from this lady, beat up some birds that are trying to steal our supplies, and deliver the goods to Mr. Salmon. He's gonna pull an all-nighter, so we just gotta wait a day. In the meantime, we're shown a flashback of Yorn in possession of a strong-looking, wood-carved version of himself. Lance and Uni make fun, but Noah believes in him. And then there's Barefoot Uni. What? Barefoot Uni? I said don't give the fans what they want! Tomorrow is here, and so is Mr. Salmon's completed vessel. Riku volunteers to be pilot, and we're we're off. I mean, it's a cool ship. There is just one more hero quest I want to do before going. A ginormous Piranus was in the way, which took about eight minutes to push down. I spent the next couple days getting revenge by harassing the turkeys, conquering their hilltop in the process. With them gone, I was able to reboot this Hulk as well. Back to the hero quest. Oliaris gives us directions to Colony 5. As we spelunked through a connecting cave, we stumbled across fresh dead bodies, presumably part of Colony 5. There are quite a few husks to send off when all of a sudden, survival 
force. We engaged in combat since we hadn't been associated with their colony yet. That is until they recognized Boliaris. They tell us how, once their colony was promoted to gold, the highest notable rank, Amobius massacred their unit, killing everyone in its sight. I try to escort them to safety, but this one won't stop running in circles. Once they're put in a safe spot, we arrive at Colony 5. Notice their flame clock is barely intact and spot Mobius sucking life from their commander. Console X is also here and reveals to us that a colony reaching gold rank is meaningless. It's just to motivate them to fight, to which then Mobius harvests their precious life force to feed on. Uni states that the only reason she tried to reach gold in the first place was so she wouldn't have to fight. <laughs> Gotta love the sound effects in this game. Am I right? X and Mobius L take a fighting stance and we go at it. I actually discovered in this battle that if your interlink is at level 3, you can start off a chain attack with Ouroboros combos. Once L is killed, the brawl comes to a stop with X running off. Noah gives a speech to which Boliaris responds. You say some weird stuff. True. What's unique about this hero quest is instead of getting a new commander, Uni's original class, Medic Gunner, can now go up to rank 20. 10 is the current cap for all the others. Now back to beating the crap out of Alexandria since I'm a way higher level now. <laughs> Revenge. Oh, not over yet? Console E is disappointed we bested her pawn to Alexandria, who he had trained. Return to your seats for act two. Carnage. There's gonna be carnage. Yeah, he also went down easily due to us being overleveled. Turns out Alexandria wanted her colony freed from the console, so she baited us into fighting him for them just so they wouldn't make enemies against the other consoles. We break their flame clock, and Alexandria joins the squad. Oh yeah, the prison break mission? Let's get back to it. No more distractions. Oh, I'm stuffed now. I, I couldn't have enough. Uh, okay, one more. I'm gonna have one more, and then that'll be it. We follow it, then run into Consul T, holding a fish and invites us over for some grub. He does have that pirate look. Instead of doing things like a typical Mobius, he likes to host challenges on three separate islands. The first is to mince up three big fishies. However, I realize I'm losing time with all these side quests, and I really want to finish the main story before my 100 days are up. Not to mention, there are a ton of meaningless required fights popping up during the main objectives. So I gotta be quick and maybe get to the side stories later if the time permits. Then there's big guys like this one, residing at locations where we're trying to gather intel for the prison break. They take a lot of time, and this is just one of many. Anyways, we gather data from one of the two islands that have the info containing the jail's blueprints. On island number two, of course, more large mini bosses. Afterwards, Shania asks Senna about her training regiment and why she calls Mio Mimi. Senna remembers the day Mio asked her to be her training partner and has ever since looked up to her. That's why she trained so hard in order to seek her approval. Shania also has a flashback, showing us that she met Consul X, telling her to be true to herself. In the morning, we discuss our plan and how we're going to sneak into the prison, which I'll spill out for you as we go. On the way there, we find someone named Fiona, stranded on a beach. But I got a game to finish, so please don't die in the next couple months. Our target is actually under the Agnes Castle. Thus, we sneak up and around to go through their ventilation. We go through a vent where there are no guards and find Gondor. Noah is surprised that Gondor is a woman. It's okay, man. I thought she was going to be from Lord of the Rings. She doesn't feel like cooperating and throws hands. My question is, if this lot is worth a mini boss fight, why don't they just break through a vent and escape themselves? Of course a guard hears the ruckus and sounds the alarm. It's then revealed that Gondor is actually Monica's daughter. Since she's not being the most helpful at the moment, we surrender our weapons to the guards that way we can get more time with Gondor, hoping she'll eventually work with us. In a nutshell, Gondor whines a bunch and Mio gets sick of it responding with a heartfelt speech. Gondor finally succumbs, giving us the key to where the real Agnes Queen is sleeping. I've got a bad feeling about this. We also have to stick around the prison for three days, which is when Agnes's next training day is scheduled, giving us a better chance to escape. Gondor concludes with this proverb. When all is lost, let him hear you roar. They had Katy Perry back then? Senna has a heart-to-heart -heart conversation with Lance about how he feels week two. Both are hoping for a chance to prove themselves. Every day in jail, you are assigned a job. Our first duty was to gather food. The next day, our given task was to hunt some meat. Later, Shania and Gondor have a little spat at each other. Gondor shares with Senna how Shania wouldn't stop copying her. Frankly, Gondor was the jerk, making fun of her weapon selection and not scoring high enough to be an Ouroboros candidate, while Gondor was top of the class. It's the third day, which means it's time for the lost numbers to distract the prison with some explosions, and we do our part by taking out the guards. Just as we make it out, Agnes Castle guards ambush us. They should have been at training, which means we have a snitch among us. 
Shania. M and N, evil versions of Mio and Noah, have shown up as well. Shania was led by her jealousy for Gondor's heritage and Uruborah's status. She likes the idea of a world where you get infinite short lives rather than the one she has now. Noah sees a way for Gondor to make it out with the key while he causes a diversion. M steps in to show why we should fear her power, yet she weeps. Why? Her Mobius special power is the ability to control others with the power of her iris. Just like she did there with Noah, Mio and others are not able to resist it either. Tyon aims his Mondo at Noah when he's controlled again and notices that damaging us also hurts him. So he's going to mark each of us with Mondos to sense who we should target. The plan is to attack a party member when they're possessed, but not too much so they wouldn't die. Then save our chain attacks for him. Just when we had M cornered, her evil buddy N comes in to save her. Man, these boss fights just don't stop. I mainly use Noah in the defender role to build up aggro in order for attacks to be focused on him, and block with Lance's blade as a shield wall. Just like victories before, they're meaningless as the cutscene shows N quite literally slicing us into pieces, including Mio's legs. They can grow back, but it does cut down the time they can use Uroboros. M doesn't seem to like it. Senna and Lance see this as an opportunity to prove themselves. They grab a hold of N and plunge into the sky. Using the last of their energy, they blast even further. Thank you, Mimi. Senna and Lands died for what they believed in. <gasps> oh, too bad. You were so close. Nah, I'm just kidding. X saves N and Tyon catches our two heroes. Z, who goes by Zed, watches from his movie theater, instructing X to seal our powers, including our weapons and even our strength. Instead of killing us, N comes up with what he perceives to be an amusing idea. The group is sent back to jail. Well, except for Mio. N wants to send off Mio at homecoming, which is just a month away, but he plans to snuff out Mio's flame during it, which will cause Mio not to be reborn. She is being held captive in a different cell and tells Noah she's already made her piece about it. Back at Sword City, Gondor and Monica argue about whether to stay on guard or go back to rescue us. Then someone appears before them. Shania shares with those in prison that the day of homecoming, she's going to have her self-killed too, but will be born again, becoming one of them. A month passes by, and Mio says, To live and learn. Sorry to ruin the mood, I just had to. Mio confesses her love for Noah and wishes she could spend more time with her Noah. Eclipse Day is here. Rico encourages Noah to try drawing Lucky Seven. and mockingly throws a flute to Noah, wanting him to set off his love into the afterlife and never to return. Of course, that's the last thing Noah wants, but it doesn't stop Mio's soul from drifting away. Mio! Oh my, they actually let her die. Now is the time for our execution. Where are we now? The afterlife? A look at another life where Mio dies also? Another glimpse shows Mio dying, but this time during a snowstorm. A third vision shows they had a baby together. And if you can sense the pattern, they watch Mio pass away a few years later. Noah awakens in the theater. Zed, the ruler of this world, says he can grant Noah's desire. Zed gets political, saying he must choose left or right. Come on, man, this is a video game. For real though, this is how evil Noah was created, formed out of a desire to have eternal life with Mio. We return to when N was about to kill Noah. However, he was stopped by M. She hands Noah her flute, then states she's sorry because her hair's gotten long and asks Noah if he will still walk alongside her. Evil M is actually Mio! N, deservedly shocked, realizes they actually killed his M. Mio explains to him that the other her couldn't follow N anymore. Back during the Agnes prison escape, M tells Mio how she felt controlled and imprisoned. She hopes that her death will help N see clearly. N his misery. With that, she also passed on her memories to Mio. The rest of the party breaks free from their bands. Noah and Mio interlink in order to draw the Sword of Origin from their chest and show N its power. Console X sees him struggling against us, so she combines the robot Agnes Queen with an Agnes Feranus. Right when the battle began, a new talent art was unlocked, the Unlimited Sword, and per tradition, we end things by destroying the Flame Clock. 
Where did a brat like him get that? <laughs> Unfortunately, Evil gets the last laugh because Agnes also has an annihilator similar to Kaves's. Shania maniacally laughs since she's the one who sold out the city's location. Dude, this is one messed up girl. That smile as she watches thousands of lives dissipate. Just kidding. Gondor's right here and shows us the new location of the city. It's actually a massive Ferranis, so they can move it anywhere they like. Mio was the one that appeared to her and Monica, letting them know to run. Shania has nowhere to go since the Mobius members have fled. So what does she do? Shania! With all of other Mio's knowledge, there's more to show Noah and their friends. And Gondor is now a selectable hero. Mio shows Noah where the city once stood, triggering a memory where Zed told him the only way to breathe life back into Mio was by killing everyone in the city. With that promise, along with an extended life as Mobius, he fulfills the request. He chose Mio over the people who also happened to be his descendants. They head back to the castle to help clean, and Uni hints at liking Tyon. Before bed, Mio is indecisive about cutting her hair or not, and expresses that it's a pain to wash. Eh, I'm choosing the long hair, baby. Before taking off to find the queen, Mio shares a flashback of when M was about to jump off a cliff, but the Agnes queen advises it won't do anything since she's a Mobius and entrusts her the key to awaken her from sleep. Gondor is then given the key by M. I'm glad Mio's back and all, but man, why did they have to go get rid of the Mobius outfit? It was legit. Noah also has some questions for Riku, like how he got his hands on that sword. We're then shown that Consul Y has awoken Kamuravi and Mia who was the friend that saved Mio's life. Then we go to a flashback where Mio is owning it at training while Miyabi is failing. Mio is to be an offseer, which she sees as unfair because she's at the top of every physical category and seems annoyed with Miyabi being the other chosen one. Mio sees this as a waste of time, but Miyabi teaches her that Kavesi share the same light as they do and expresses the importance of offseeing. Imagine you were just stuck in a body. Noah asks about Colony Omega. For a time, Senna and Mio were transferred to it. The colony didn't fight, rather why came to examine them for unknown reasons. Then an accident happened, exposing poison and sporadic explosions. Miyabi saved Mio and Senna, gave her flute, and sent them off in an escape pod. From M's memories, we now know why has restored the colony. Before entering the colony, we're confronted by a unit mixed with Agnes and Kavesi soldiers, causing the group to question why are they being experimented with together. Even weirder was they ran into Moamba, Kamuravi too. Miyabi pulls her flute out and starts playing. Consul Y shows his face and says all of them are revenants controlled only to battle. They are not reborn the typical way, rather brought to life during their final year. He also mentions that Mobius are Zed's avatars. Why's special gift is making flame clocks. The purple flame clock you see here has the power to bring back those who were close to their homecoming. Noah believes the power of music can get through to them and asks the others to defend him and Mio. Their memories begin to return, blowing Wai's mind because he cleansed their minds beforehand. But you know, power of music. Why goes morbid time. His Mobius form is larger than the others, and a tedious one at that. Toward the end of my first attempt, he went straight for the healers. My second try, I took a swing with Senna equipped with Gondor's martial artist class, and the continuing damage output from it led to an awesome Senna cutscene. Wow, Noah slices the limited edition flame clock. Why reckons he'll see us again? Miyabi joins the crew, and Mio's original class Zephyr can now go up to rank 20. No reunion with Mwamba? That's kind of a letdown. Well, onward to the Cloud Keep where the Agni and Queen lies. A third Mio? Meh, I guess the others don't see it. <laughs> Well, that moment was short-lived. She was shot and killed by Yorin and Mobius D. They were able to follow us here because Mio is now half Mobius. Lance questions Yorin why he would hang around such douchebags. Yorin spells it out, informing us that once you become Mobius, you're treated to the memories of all your past lives. And each of his had pathetic endings where he was the loser. Jay spawns a duplicate of himself in battle. It does not fix his loser status, though. Yorin, recovering from our pouncing, states how much he hated being the worm of the group. He wanted his own wings to end up like the carving he made, and to finally feel the approval from others. Land shares how Yorin's death changed him, and is forever grateful for it. Senna pipes in as well, exclaiming the world they want to mold is one where you get to choose who you are, not the same routine where you have a similar life each cycle. Yorin, starting to feel what they're telling him, gets stomped on by D, and calls him a loser. They interlink, however D has full control. D's memories show he was always a jerk. In past lives, he would kill his fellow soldiers that he thought were weak, and collect the head 
heads of those he slaughtered. Determined, the party commits to tear him apart to save their friend Yorin. Between attempts, once I was able to rework the team into classes they actually excelled in, we were able to make quick work of that numbskull. He claims that's impossible since he's known to be Black Blaze Dirk. Cool story, bruh. He continues to constantly berate Yorin, causing our friend to switch sides, tricking D into giving him power. Too much power. Overflowing him and sucking in Black Fog, sacrificing himself once again for his friends. In the end, it was his choice. That problem's been resolved, but what are we supposed to do without the queen? Oh, she's alive? No explanation given? Behold, Queen Nia of Agnes. We're then given a brief history on when the queen's worlds collided. They each constructed half an arc that contained the souls of their people. Once the worlds would intersect, all would be wiped away clean. That is, until they used the power of their common light to create origin, both of the arcs combined. However, the world became still and frozen because of Mobius. Zed captured the Kevesi queen to access the memories contained in origin. With her heart used as a key, he could access origin and determine the rules of this world. Nia used hers to create Ouroboros, and Lucky Seven is actually the Sword of Origin. She says Origin lies in the sea and that the Kavesi Queen is there too. However, the vortex surrounding them could tear us apart. How is the team supposed to make it through? Well, Mr. Saman, of course. He's actually already finished upgrading the vessel. That seems a little too convenient. So we he still needs six more components, though. I knew it couldn't be that easy. Or maybe it is, because he's got the location pinpointed for all six of them. First, from the Queen. Then I spent the next day booting up a Ferranus Hulk. Don't worry, I wasn't sidetracked. It was just near another piece. Got a little lost looking for the third piece, but you know what they say about big fish. Eventually, I find another piece of origin metal. The fourth was in the desert, where we had to dig up some holes to find it. Dig it up, oh. Next, I had to kill this big frog thing because it ate that hunk of metal for breakfast. The last piece was in the Kavesi castle. First, I rail grinded around the building to nab the goods from this container. Then went back to initiate the cutscene. We can go across those islands. That way, we should be able to swing around the back. What? I just did that! Whatever, we make it to the throne room where we find Chris. He's in possession of the last piece. And he's one of the kinder Mobiuses, blasting off the queen's head for us. Now, there's actually been some recent flashbacks involving this guy, but in my opinion, he was mainly filler. His name is Chris. He was Noah's off-seer instructor. He had good intentions when joining Mobius and wanted to see Noah again. Although, he insists that Zed forces humans to become Mobius through his deceiving methods. Noah's class sword fight can now reach rank 20 and with the final component in hand make our way back to Mr. Salmon. As we wait for him to upgrade the vessel, Mio talks to us about Mobius, how they cannot be brought back to life, but each of them are fundamentally aware of it. This makes Yorin's sacrifice even more meaningful to the Kavesi trio. We must put an end to this, so we kick the ship into high gear at high velocity, activate the cloaking device, and dive into the sea. Origin takes to the skies and starts blasting shots in many directions. Both Agnes and Kavesi colonies are targeted, some of the lost numbers as well. Mio being part of Mobius is able to unravel Zed's plan. He's planning on flickering out every living thing in the world, even those who are on his side, to not only power himself up, but to also start everything over. Closing in on Origin, Noah pushes the throttle to the max, elevating near the center of it. Riku deploys the ram to break through the multiple layers of Origin. After quite the rumble tumble, they've made it inside. Sensing our presence, Zed commands the now depressed end to take up his sword. This is definitely very Final Dungeon-esque, since there are many rooms and levels to traverse. On top of that, there's lots of monsters to fight that take a lot of time to defeat, resulting in this dungeon crawl taking a few days. We finally reach the nucleus of origin, where we find the Kvesi Queen is being held, and awaits us and drops this menacious, vengeful line. Well, don't you look smug with my woman on your arm. Oh, it is on! This duel gets a little repetitive because it has two phases. No new evil Mobius form, just a stronger end the second time. I went in too casually, not optimizing my team with the proper classes and items. Next time, I brought in Miyabi as a third healer and played as Uni to make sure for myself no one would be dead or injured for too long. After that long 20-minute battle, Mew admonishes Noah for not even realizing how he has changed. He no longer would call himself Noah or his love Mio, instead referring to themselves only by their letters. And finally, 
finally gets it and is ready to move forward rather than dwelling in the now. He touches Noah's hand, then disappears. We're now able to carry out our first objective of this final mission, freeing the Kavesi Queen Melia. She tells us Zed is not a person, but a concept. He is a true Mobius. He is and is not an individual. And I just have to call out this next part. Queen Melia calls each of them by name and most of their mouths don't even move when responding. Noah. <sighs> Mia. <sighs> Lance, <gasps> Senna, Tyon, <gasps> Uni. <gasps> Before leaving to free her people, Riku and the Queen share a nod. That little bugger knows something. I know he's hiding something. I'll let it slide for now since we need to go find Zed. There's still a lot of dungeon crawling and we have to fight a gauntlet of droidicas. It's one challenge after another with Consul X greeting us in the following chamber. We defeat her and... Oh, no cutscene. <laughs> she straight up dies. That probably means Y is up next. Yep, there he is. There were some close calls and some sick moments, like when the AI prompted Lance to shield block me as I revived our mates. Noah, give him a spin. No cutscene is given for Wise death either. The end is within our grasp. We enter the theater and find Zed at last. Zed's speech reveals that he was able to convince all these people to become Mobius by giving them impossible choices that they could not refuse. Why? It simply amuses him. He doesn't believe they should have a choice while we fight for that freedom. He can change the terrain from icy to literally making the floor lava. I had to use the command follow the leader to bring all the party members over to a safe spot. Then shifts back to attack mode. Once we're able to free ourselves from these chains, a chain attack automatically begins with the Ouroboros bonus. Still, the damage being dealt is minimal. Uni and Tyon follow suit, breaking from their shackles. A little later, Noah and Mio continue the chain attack frenzy. Over 20 minutes of whittling away at Zed's health, Noah steps up to the plate, stabbing his sword into the ground, disintegrating everything. Zed's true form is shown. He asks if we really want to do this, because if we do, it could lead to oblivion if the world Worlds collide again. The origin structure transforms into more artillery, firing back at the colonies. Queen Melia also transforms the Kavesi castle into a super fighting robot. Queen Agnes follows the trend of her foe and comrade, turning her castle into a war machine as well. Now, as sick as some of these war scenes are, I'm a little disappointed with the final boss. We just stand in one place the whole time while the big purple head maniacally laughs every once in a while. There is a third phase where you take him on with only the Kavesi members of the team, and it happens to the Agnes trio too. Heroes we've recruited during our journey pop in to help also. For the final phase, we're all back together. Halfway through, the queens blast at origin, then they join the fight. Hold on, I gotta go to the bathroom. This finale is taking forever. As we cut away at Zed's last HP, we're still arguing about the importance of choice. The spirits of N and M flow out of Noah and Mio. Zed is all but an intense desire for safety that each of us embody. They lunge in with their souls, stopping that desire once and for all. With that evil finally gone, Noah ponders for a moment and chucks his blade into the vast ocean. It's time to say goodbyes. Noah and Mio exchange a kiss. Their worlds begin to drift, and each of the pairs give one last look to each other. I'm gonna cry. So let's just watch. There's also a bunch of what I'm guessing are cameos. I feel like I've seen some of these characters from promotional material, but I'm sure seasoned fans will get a kick out of them. I know they just separated, but I'm gonna get the gang back together because we still have a few days left, baby. I go back to save Fiona's buddies from invading Kvesi soldiers. Once they're back together, the game blacks out the screen for this moment. Tickle ambush! Kitchy, kitchy, kitchy! Stop it! 
Well, that was weird. Things aren't too hunky-dory for long since Fiona's troops are now under Mobius control. Turns out Fiona's closest friend, Irma, is the Mobius causing all the trouble. Lance goes in for the attack, but is stopped by Fiona. Irma doesn't have the same sentiment, shooting her right in the back. We kill Irma and smash the flame clock. Fiona joins us. Then it was back to console Triton to beat him at his own games. He's kind of a sore loser, sucker punching lands, instigating a made up challenge on the spot. The man's got harpoons for hands. Things settle down and Triton tells us he has forgotten how to transform into Mobius. He asks us to break the flame clock to free his friends since he no longer sees death like other Mobius do. He wants to join the team going against his own kind after having learned the value of humanity. Back at Sword City, Shania is terrorizing the people with her new Mobius powers. Not a very experienced one though, losing to a punch from Gondor. She did have quite the condescending mother always telling her she was not enough and taught her to hate Gondor. She even believed Shania after her death, sparking some compassion within Gondor. Day 92, Tyon receives word from his past commander that Nimue, the lady who saved his life, has been reborn into a colony that needs protection. We wipe out the initial fleet that was sent to exterminate them. We stick around because there are expected to be more invasions. While waiting, Riku fixes their Feranus. Tyon directs it to lure the enemy machinery away, so we can sneak up on Consul V from the back. Wait! Is this a trap? We thwart his plans and dispose of his Faranus. I go on looking for more to do and find Kamuravi. We offer him a better life in the city, which coincidentally, just as we arrive, this Nopon accidentally freed Ethel from her growth module. We find her and Kamuravi is quick on his feet, catching her right after she falls. He wishes to do more good, so he comes along with us. How I'm able to find these hero quests is by looking for question marks on the map. I spot one at Kavesi where we see Queen Melia trying to sneak out. We offer to take the queen with us to ease the guards of their worries. I wasn't expecting it, but she comes along as a hero. I went straight to Agnes Castle, hoping Neo would do the same. However, I realized I was at the wrong place, remembering she's at the Cloud Keep. And bada bing bada boom, she is recruited. I was so close to meeting both of my goals, which were to beat the game and unlock every hero class within 100 days. Unfortunately, I just couldn't figure out where the last hero was. After reaching the 100 day mark, I looked it up. It's the jankiest method of them all, having to complete a string of side quests that eventually lead to this moment. Senna knocks down the Levness, injuring the pilot in the process, who looks rather young. We bring her back to the city, giving her proper medical attention. When communicating, her phrases sound robotic. We get an incoming call from her console, asking us to bring her back in exchange for peace. We do so cautiously and discover that other children are there, but their light drains much quicker due to the machines they pilot. We watch one of them die right before our eyes, so we break our agreement with the console in order to save the others. He orders the younglings to kill us, but our new friend has a change of heart, betraying her master. And there you have it. The final class machine assassin completes my adventure in Xenoblade Chronicles 3. Give the video a like to support the video and subscribe to the channel if you want to see more Nintendo content. For the most part, I enjoyed the story with some mixed feelings about the combat system. It may just not be my style. Nonetheless, I'm glad I was finally able to play a Xenoblade game. You all have a good one. Thanks.